Hello and welcome to the session. This is Professor Farhat. In this session, we look at the budgeting process. It's a topic that's covered in managerial as well as cost accounting. This is a cost accounting course, but remember cost accounting and managerial accounting, they cover close to 80% the information overlap. But anyhow, to find more lectures, you could visit my website for additional lectures about the topic or related topic. Now this session, it's gonna be more than 30 minutes and I hope not too much more than 30 minutes because there's a World Cup game I would like to view uh, within that time period. But if it takes longer, it's the nature of the beast. So the budgetary process, I can break this process into multiple step, but I don't like to. I would like to show you the whole process. This way you can see through how things are processing from the beginning till the end. Anyhow, you could always stop and come back and view the lecture later. So that's not a problem. So what is the budgetary process and what is a budget? Um, are you going to be completing a whole budget? Most probably not, unless you work for a small nonprofit organization or a small business or you own the business. But most probably in your lifetime, you're going to be dealing with, maybe you're going to be responsible for part of the budget. So it's very important that you familiarize yourself. The first thing I need to tell you about the budget, the budget will be wrong. What do I mean by will be wrong? The budget, it's not going to be 100% accurate. So, so why do we prepare a budget if we know it's not going to be 100% accurate? Because we need some directions. We need some directions. So therefore, we prepare a budget. We don't want to fly blind because anything could happen. So we just want to kind of have a starting point, some direction, so we don't fly blind. The budget that we're going to be preparing, it's going to be called the master or the static budget. What does it mean, master or a static budget? It means it's affixed for a certain number of units. But anyway, we're going to be dealing with variances later. So that's why we start with a static budget. Then from the static budget, we'll prepare a flexible budget. Then we prepare, we, we prepare some variances. But for now, we're going to be preparing a static budget so you know what type of budget we are preparing. Okay? And we have to remember there are many steps that goes through the uh, budgeting process. So that's another thing you need to be aware of. And that's why it's going to take a little bit of time, a little bit of time. And usually we prepare a budget for one year. Now we break the budget into monthly, but it's going to be for one year. Then we total all the months and it will be for one year. Now, how do we start the budget? How does it begin? Well, before we punch the numbers, the company will need to answer certain questions. What are those certain questions? There are many questions they will need to answer. For example, what product are we selling? What product are we selling? Are we making any changes to our current product? Why? Because that's going to change our production cost. If we are making any changes, our production cost will change. Are we introducing a new product? If we're introducing a new product, then also we have a cost for that. Are we changing our marketing strategy? How are we marketing our product? If that's the case, our advertising and selling expenses will change. Our commission will change. Our commission expense. Is there any changes in the distribution channel? Are we selling directly? Are we selling to uh, retailers? So are we building new warehouses? Are we, are we closing existing, existing warehouses? Um, other questions will be pricing strategy. What is our goal in our pricing strategy? Are we trying to capture market share? Therefore, um, have, uh, have, uh, have aggressive discount? Are we targeting any specific company? Are we targeting a competitor? What is our pricing strategy? And is there any changes in the production process? Are we changing how we produce our items? Are we replacing any equipment? Are we making our process a little bit more efficient? And many, many other questions. The reason I'm going through this list of questions is simple. Just to tell you that the numbers that we're gonna go over, that's not what matters. What matters is the, is the company's culture, is the company's value, it's the company's strategy behind the numbers, okay? So there are many things that goes behind the numbers because you're wondering, how did they come up with this number? Just there are many things that goes into that, that figure. Okay, so let's go ahead and start the process. And the first thing we are going to prepare is something called the sales forecast. And what is the sales forecast? Basically trying to predict what are we, how much are we going to be selling? Is this an easy process? Not at all. This is the most difficult and important, most important and difficult and difficult aspect of budgeting. How do we forecast? How can we forecast? Well, we can ask our salespeople, like how much you think will be our sales? We can ask market researchers. We can see our trend. Are we going up every year? 5%, 5%, 5%. Well, we're going to go up this year 5%. We could use econometrics model, complicated model, such as if we change uh, the material that goes into our product, reduce our cost, increase our marketing, 
um, change our distribution channel, what would happen to the end product? What would, what's, what's the projection for our sales? So we could use many factors. The model is called econometrics model. So worst case situation, best guess. So this is how we predict sales. But sales is very important. So we're going to be starting always with sales. So sales is basically the first schedule that we're going to be working with and to and to make this and to make this process make sense specifically we're going to be selling pants cutting pants to be more specific and this is sample of our product so what happened is this the first thing we do is as i said we start with the sales schedule so what do we do in the sales schedule the sales schedule just to kind of re repeat myself it's going to drive everything in the budget so this is the key driver for the whole budget so it's going to drive everything in the budget so if this is wrong so if the sales schedule is wrong everything else in the budget that's going to follow it's going to be wrong because it's going to be based on that now what do we do well we need to we need to um uh, determine how many units are we going to selling and obviously for what period okay and basically also what we need to know is the units and what is what is the price what is the selling price i'm gonna call this sp what's the selling price so here we have to predict two things how many units and this is most important what's the selling price and also for what period okay once again how do we book this how do we book this is uh, how do we book this it's based on based on a prior year forecast uh, increasing by 10 percent we could use many other factors now it's as simple as that we're going to take units times selling price it's going to give us total sales in its simplest form for our purposes we're going to be working with a company called san diego pants so what's their uh, what's their budgeting they're going to be budgeting 160,000 units so they're going to be selling 160,000 pants at a price at at a price at $45 at a price at $45 total sales of $7.2 million $7.2 million okay after the selling schedule once we determine how many units we are going to sell which is happens to be 160,000 units the next thing we are going to determine is our production schedule what is our production schedule what is our production schedule okay basically once we know how many units you tell me how many units we need to sell then I will tell you how much tell me how many units you need to sell I will tell you how many how many units I need to produce so we're going to sell we said in the planning process for this for the sake of this example we said we are going to sell 160,000 we are going to sell 160,000 unit then let me use let me use the uh, I'm not going to use figures. I'm just going to use formula. So we're going to take the sales plus we're going to add to the sales. Whatever the sales is, we're going to add desired ending inventory. Now, what is the desired ending inventory? It's let's assume this. We are predicting the month of January. So okay. So we are producing for January. We also we want to make sure we have some units and in ending inventory for the month of. February why because when we start February we need to have some units ready when the when the production when the production start when the production start so sales plus the desired ending unit it's going to give us what we need to produce but we're not done yet then remember since we have since we are predicting for the next month from the previous month we're going to have some units available we're going to deduct any beginning inventory from the prior unit and this is what we need for our production requirement okay so need to produce here I'm assuming that we did not have any ending inventory but we have if we have any ending inventory we have to subtract so let's assume just use simple example use simple numbers we need to, we, um, our 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 estimated sales is 100 unit we need to have 10% for the 10, 10 units for the following month so this is 110 let's assume from the prior month we had five units it mean it means we need to produce 105 units and this is my production requirement i need to produce 105 units so notice this number here 105 unit started with the estimated sales so if this number is wrong then everything else is wrong okay and let's use this information for for our production budget here 
we are starting with 160,000 units sales, budgeted sales. And let's assume for our purposes, we have we have 5,000 units in beginning inventory and 15,000 in ending inventory. So what does that mean? It means we started with 160,000 plus we need 15,000 for the next month. But we are starting the month with 5,000 units. Therefore, we need to produce production, required production. We need to produce for this example, 170,000 units. Another way to look at it is something like this. Uh, basically expected sales is 160 plus the ending desired ending inventory which is total needs of 175 minus what we have in beginning inventory gives us what we need to produce 170,000 units once again I don't need to repeat this if this is wrong then how, how much we need to produce is wrong as well okay uh, the next thing we're going to look at is the production cost. What is the production cost? Basically, we need labor, material, and overhead to produce the product. So basically, what we need is some material, labor, and overhead to mix them all together. And remember, overhead would include indirect labor, indirect material, and others. We mix them all together to produce the product. Now, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be also preparing a schedule for each one of them, starting with the direct labor cost or direct for, no, we're gonna start with direct material, okay? How much material do I need? Well, what's my production need? Based on my production need, I will I will figure out my material, okay? So how do I do this? Basically, I need to know how many, how many units I am producing, okay? For example, I'm producing for the purpose of my example, 100 and uh, what's my units and what's the production needed? For this purpose, 170 units need to be produced. But whatever unit I need to produce, I need to budget for it, okay? So if I'm producing 170,000 unit and I need two pound per unit, whatever, you know, whatever I'm doing, then I need to budget, what's that? That's 340,000 pounds of material for my, uh, to produce this. But also there's a formula for the direct material schedule. What I'm gonna be starting with, let's assume I need one unit to produce one unit I need, just for the sake of illustration, I need 10 pounds, okay? So one unit times 10 pounds, it means I need, you know, basically, let's do it this way. So I, I need to produce 10, um, one unit, and each unit is, for each unit, I need 10 pounds. Each unit, I need 10 pounds. Well, so let's assume I need only one unit, so that's going to be, I need 10 pounds. Then... I am going to add any desired ending inventory. Again, I need the material for this period and I need some material to be ready on hand for the next period. Then let's assume I need four pounds of, mat four pounds of material for the next period. That's equal to 14. Then guess what? Then when I start the period, I may start with some material from the prior period. Let's assume that I started with two pounds. It means I need 12 pounds of material now now I need 12 pounds of material this is what I need to purchase and what I did I just this is I just started my purchasing schedule let's assume the pound is two dollars well I need to budget purchase of 24 dollars okay so this is how, how it basically worked what I need what I need okay I said I need one unit then I add to a desired ending inventory uh, then subtract from it beginning ending inventory basically the same concept as we did earlier and basically most inventory they follow the same concept for the purpose of our example which is the uh, here's what we need uh, to produce to produce those cut and pens that we talked about we need three yard we have two types of material we, we have cotton regular cotton and fine cotton we need three yard of regular cotton and the cost per yard is three dollars the fine cotton is a little bit more higher price five dollars but we only need 0.2 yards we have in beginning inventory we have 10,000 yards and we would like to have an ending inventory 15,000 yards for the regular cotton the same thing for fine cotton we need uh, we we have in beginning inventory 1,000 and we need to have an ending inventory 1,000 now let's go ahead and figure out how many how much material do we need? How much material? How many yards do we need? Well, let's look at the cotton. The cotton, remember, we need one hundred. We need to produce one hundred and seventy thousand unit times three. Three. What is three? Three is the three yard per unit. Three yard per unit. Then we add to it 
okay because this is how much we add to it the beginning inventory then we have beginning inventory of 15,000 then we subtract ending inventory simply put we need 500,000 and 15 515 515,000 yards of the regular cotton for the fine cotton we need we need to produce 170,000 unit the uh, the production the the each unit would consume 0.2 yard of a cotton of the fine cotton we started with 1000 unit with 1000 yard we need to end up with 1000 yard basically those two cancel cancel each other out so we need to have 34000 yards of fine cotton for our production based on our production schedule remember i know, i i'm going to keep repeating this a sales if sales is wrong then all these figures are wrong as well now let's take a look at this schedule basically what is the schedule basically the schedules given us how much do we need to buy how much do we need to buy let's take a look first at the regular cotton again we need to produce 170,000 unit uh, total production need uh, 170,000 unit times 3 is 510,000 add the desired ending inventory subtract the ending inventory we need to purchase 515,000 of yards of fine of regular cotton multiply this by three dollars we need one million five hundred forty five dollars one million five hundred forty five thousand for the cotton the regular cotton for the fine cotton we'll do the same thing one hundred and seventy thousand unit times 0.2 that's got we need thirty four thousand yards at beginning inventory subtract ending inventory we need to purchase thirty four thousand five dollar per yard one hundred and seventy thousand dollar add those two together we need to come up with on our direct material budget, one million seven hundred and fifteen thousand. One million seven hundred and fifteen fifteen thousand. Okay. So this is the, the direct material production. The fourth schedule, which is direct labor. Now I need labor. How does labor work? Basically, for every unit, let's assume for every unit, I need five hours. Okay. Well, simply put, if I'm producing. Uh, 10,000 unit that's easy times five hours I need 50,000 hours and I can I and uh, 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 I'm paying my employees $20 per hour one two three four five and ten so it's a one two three four five it's gonna be six zeros so I need I need six zeros here if my if my addition is right one two three four five plus ten six yes i need a million dollar in my in my labor budget i just figure out my labor budget i need a million dollar and that's important because you want to know how much you need to produce this way you know how much employee how many employees to hire this way you know how to how much to budget once again it's all driven it's all driven by sales how it's all driven by sales so this number of unit it's how many do I how many am I how many do am I selling or am I producing how many am I how much am I selling will drive my production or production will drive my material and my labor budget so it all goes back to sales I know I keep repeating myself but that's fine for our purposes units to produce is 170,000 unit and we need half an hour for each unit so we need 85,000 late total labor hours needed to produce what we need to produce we are paying our employees $22 per hour so that's one million eight hundred and seventy thousand and this is our direct labor cost now what we need to do also we have to keep in mind that we also have a schedule for the overhead and the overhead it's going to be by function for example insurance supply so on and so forth um and we do this and by the way when we prepare those schedule we prepare those schedule on a monthly basis and why do you say on a monthly basis so we can compare what's happening from month to month okay what happened to the budget what happened to the actual which is something we're going to be dealing with later in this not in the session but in the next session so let's take a look at our overhead schedule just to see what the overhead looks like so we need variable overhead needed to produce 170,000 units and direct material and supplies 30 cent per unit so we need 51,000 material handling this is the this is the variable overhead we need 40 cent per unit again what we're doing is multiplying those by 170,000 which is from our production budget 170,000 remember the production budget is based on the sales budget other indirect labor is 10 pennies 10 pennies which is 17,000 so the total variable overhead is 160 36,000 
fixed manufacturing overhead we have supervisory labor 100 1. uh, 102,000 um repair and maintenance plant administration utilities depreciation insurance property taxes so on and so forth a total of 544,000 so the total manufacturing overhead variable plus fixed equal to 680,000 dollars now also what we can do we could compute and now of course if we have any selling a general and administrative will have a schedule for that and most of the time selling general and administrative most of the time they're fixed in nature once again because they're fixed in nature whatever whether they're fixed or not we prepare them month to month comparison okay now we could also prepare cost of goods sold schedule what is cost of goods sold schedule basically we need to prepare eventually a an income statement eventually in the balance sheet so it's very important to know what is our cost of goods sold what is our cost of goods sold it's di it's direct material sorry it's direct material direct labor plus manufacturing overhead those are the three so for the material we started with the material right here we started with 35,000 we purchased 1,715 material available for manufacturing 1,750 ending inventory we have 50,000 remaining it means it means total material cost is 1.7 million so so this is our direct material used in the production direct labor 1,870,000 and uh, top manufacturing overhead 680,000 labor ma labor material and overhead total manufacturing cost 4,250,000 now if we have anything in ending work and process we will subtract anything in ending work and process because it's 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 going to stay with us ending work and process we don't we happen to have we, we happen not to have anything then we add any beginning inventory because the beginning inventory it's going to be with us this period then we subtract any ending finished goods inventory okay finished goods inventory 375,000 cost of goods sold is 3,995,000 <clears throat> why is this number important this number important because we're going to be preparing a an income statement basically an income statement to be more specific a budgeted income statement a budgeted income statement means it's an income statement that's based on our budgeted numbers so let's take a look at our budgeted uh, actually we're going to look at marketing and administrative cost sgna so we're going to have some variable component some fixed component so let's take a look at it uh here we go we have sales commission this is based on total sales this is assuming 160,000 unit which is this is what we estimated in sales multiplied by 150 our sales commission will be 240,000 other marketing costs which is variable 120 um, then we have our fixed marketing cost sales salaries which are fixed advertising which is fixed and other fixed cost so total fixed marketing cost 350 variable three 350 and 360 total marketing cost is 710 now we have sgna as i told you most of it is fixed such as administrative legal and accounting data processing outside professional services like consulting services maybe auditing so on and so forth uh, interests uh taxes okay total administrative cost total budget mark total budgeted marketing and administrative 1,506,000 again where is this number coming from most probably it's coming from prior period once we have the schedule once we have cost of goods sold once we have the sales schedule we are ready to prepare our income our budgeted income statement again budgeted income statement looks like a regular income statement except that you are dealing with budgeted figures starting with sales so sales is 160,000 and we're going to sell each pant for 45 dollars quite an expensive pants our total sales is 7.8 million based on a budget of 160 now remember remember this budget this is called the mass this is part of the master budget why this is important this is a static budget static means it's based on this figure 160. eventually we are going to do some comparison later on called variances so remember that we work with this budget cost of goods sold we computed it to be 3,995,000. marketing and administrative uh, total budgeted cost five million five hundred and a thousand uh budgeted operating profit almost 1.7 million federal and other taxes we're going to have to pay 550,000 and the budgeted profit is 1 million 149,000 that's all good and dandy but this is an income statement and remember an income statement is based on what 
an income statement is based on the cruel accounting. A cruel accounting is different than cash. What matters for the controller of the company, for the people that work there, is actual cash. What's actual cash? It means how much cash did I bring in? How much cash did I bring out? How much cash do I need? So on and uh, so on and so forth. Okay, so let's take a look at our cash. So the first thing we need to know is in our cash, where is cash coming from? Okay. The cash budget is a statement of cash on hand at the start of the budget period, expected cash receipts, expected cash disbursement, and the resulting balance at the end of the period. So how does cash work? Well, we're, we're going to have a beginning balance, then we're going to have some receipts, we're going to have some uh, disbursement, okay? And we're going to net them out, and we're going to figure out what's the balance, and if we have any desired balance, we might have to borrow some money. It's as simple as that. So let's assume we started with, the, with the $100, just to use simple figures here. We started with $100, and we expect to receive $230, and we expect to disperse $220. Okay, so this is going to be $110, but we would like to have $150. It means we are short $40, so we need to make sure we can borrow $40 from somewhere because next period we need to start with $150, which is our desired balance. But we need to know what our cash receipts. Cash receipts comes from usually collection of receivable, cash sales, if we sold any asset during the period, if we borrowed, or if we issued stocks, basically, you know, issuing stocks or issuing bonds, or some other factor, who knows from where, but those are the main factors. We also need to know what is our cash disbursement. Well, what do you think the cash disbursement would involve in a manufacturing environment? Well, material purchases, manufacturing cost, operating activities to pay our employees, pay debt, if we happen to buy, be buying a new asset, pay our shareholders dividend, pay our taxes, and any other payment we need to come up with. So this is what the cash budget a cash budget would look like, just kind of just to show you an example of it. Let's assume the beginning cash is 830,000. We have collection on account, 6,840, collection on employee loans. I guess the employees we lend them some money, they're going to be paying us back. So the total cash receipts 6,940,000. Then we, this is our disbursement, okay, total disbursement. So what we do is beginning plus what we're going to be receiving minus what we're going to be paying. It's going to be our budgeted ending cash, 371. If this number is, is good for us, is, if this number is, yes, acceptable, then we don't have to do anything. Let's assume we need half a million for the next period. Then we need to borrow the difference, okay? Or if we need to pay back some loans because we are above the desired balance, then we'll subtract it. Now, the question is, how do we know how much are we going to be collecting on account? How much are we going to be paying on accounts payable? Well, that depends on our pattern. What is our pattern? Depending on our pattern, how often, uh, how do we, when we make a sale, when do we expect to receive our payment? When we purchase something, when do we expect to receive our, our payment? So basically, let's take a look at this example just to show you how this works. So you know how to work with account receivable and accounts payable patterns. For example, this company here, Santiago, cash collected from the current month sales is 20%. So wherever we sell in that month, we collect immediately 20%. Cash collected from last month's sales, so from the previous month, we collect 75% of it. Um, cash discount taken, we're going to be basically, some people buy and they pay within the discount period. They're going to get 2% off, and we're going to write off 3% as bad debt, people that don't pay us, which is basically we lose 5% between bad debt and, uh, and cash discount. Okay? So let's see how this works. January sales is 500000 February sales is four fifty, March sales is 600000 So let's go ahead and start with this. For January, we're going to be collecting... 20% um, collected in January, 75% collected in February, and 5% basically not collected. So for January, we made a sales of half a million. We're going to take half a million multiplied by 20%. They're going to pay us that month. So we're going to get $100,000, 20% of half a million. From the prior period, the prior period, which is December of the prior year, December of the prior year, we had... $540,000 of receivable, basically, we received it. Therefore, the cash for January is $640,000. For February, February sales is 
450,000, we're gonna get 20% of it right there. Then also we're gonna be receiving in February, how much of January we're gonna be receiving? 75% of January. January sales is half a million. 75% of it is 375, which is we received 375, okay? Then March, March we're gonna be receiving. March we had 600,000 in sales, $600,000 in sales. We're gonna be receiving 20% immediately, which is 120,000. Then February, in February we had $450,000 in sales and we're gonna be receiving 75% of that, which is 300, $37,500. Together will give us $457,500. So this is going to be the total for the quarter, March, April, May, and whatever we collected from the previous month, $1,562,000. Also for the cash disbursement payment, the company will have basically some sort of a pattern. For example, when we pay for our expenditure, Cash disbursement for the current month, 50%. So whatever we pay, whatever we buy, we pay 50% in that month. And cash disbursement for prior month, we pay 40, 48% from the prior month. And we pay some of our, some of it was paid earlier, so we'll get always 2% off. So let's take a look at an example to see how it works. Uh, expected purchases for three months, we expect to purchase 120, 200, and 250. Those are what we expect to purchase. Once again, for January, we pay immediately. We're going to be buying 120. We pay immediately $60,000 of it in that, in that month. 60,000 of it is paid within that, within that month immediately. Okay. Then from the prior period, we had 256,000 of accounts payable. We're going to pay it off. That's fine. Um, then, then 57,000. 57,600, uh, that's for February. February, were Feb what was February purchases? February purchases were, no, sorry. Um, let's look at February purchases, 200,000. We're gonna pay 50% immediately. Then we are going to pay for 48% of the prior month, which is 120 times 48%, which is 57,600. And what we're doing in this example, also we are assuming that we have an additional cash payment of 250, 250 of 250. This could be paying down a loan, making payment on a piece of equipment, whatever the reason is. If there is a cash disbursement, we'll have to include it in there. And March will do the same thing. Half of March and 48% of February is paid. Then we add all the cash disbursement out, which is, happens to be 1,444,000. $44,600. Now also we could prepare, not we could, we should prepare a budgeted balance sheet. And basically what, you, what, what is a budgeted balance sheet? We'll take our beginning balances in the balance sheet. If there's any addition to each, each, each one of those, like for example, if we're receiving that much cash, deducting that much cash, we'll get to the ending balance for cash and we'll do the same thing for the others. For example, receivable, that's our beginning balance. That's where we're gonna add that much receivable, we're gonna be receiving that much receivable, and that's the ending balance. So basically we find the ending balance of each account, also for the liabilities, also for stockholders. If you have any questions, any comments, by all means email me or see me in class. If you're studying for your CPA exam, you know, knowing how to create a budget is important, but also what's gonna be important next is how we prepare variances. So stay tuned to prepare variances, different type of variances.